Okay, so here's a simulation that shows a pulse release of a compound that's transported from left to right. There's the release, it travels in this way, dispersion causes it to spread out, the concentration to diminish, um, and there may be also some sorption that delays the transport of this compound. So one of the things that's done is to use this kind of a pulse tracer test to determine some aquifer properties. And if we use a conservative tracer, a tracer that moves with the water and doesn't sorb, then we can get characteristics of the travel of the water. And if we use a compound that does sorb, then we can get characteristics that describe how that sorption um, retards the flow or the, the velocity of the contaminant movement. And so here's some plots of the um, concentration as a function of time at a point that's downstream from the release point of the pulse. A conservative tracer would look like this, this blue curve. And uh, this was done by um, using a compound that had zero sorption. So the concentration increases, reaches a peak, and drops off. And it spread out like this because of dispersion. A compound that, that does undergo sorption has a breakthrough curve or a concentration of the function of time that looks like this. The peak is diminished and the, uh, the concentration is spread out in time. It also arrives at a later time than the arrival of the peak uh, from the conservative tracer. Now we can use these data, these plots, to calculate um, various two, two important terms. And so if we go over here to the PowerPoint, I'll show you how to do that. So here's just the layout of the test, the release point, the measurement point, separated by a distance we'll call L. And here are the two curves that we just saw. So one thing we might want to get is the average linear flow velocity in the aquifer. So we'll assume at this point that we've conducted this test in the field, and these curves are actual observations that we made at a, at a point down here. So the uh, average linear flow velocity is the distance divided by the travel time. And so we can determine the travel time uh, from the blue curve uh, by taking the first moment of this curve. And I did that in the analysis, and it's 9,200 seconds. The distance in the analysis is 300 meters, so the average linear velocity is determined from this arrival time curve as uh, 0 0.032 meters per second. Now, the effective porosity is uh, determined as the ratio of the volumetric flux uh, to the, actually, that should be, let me make an adjustment here, that should be V. So the effective porosity is the ratio of the flux to the velocity. So flux in the model, we just specified that as 0 0.01 meters per second. In the field, we could determine that using uh, measurements of the gradient and the hydraulic conductivity. So we take the ratio, and that gives us uh, 0 0.0 or 0 0.31. And in the model, we specified the porosity as 0.3. So Essentially, those are the same within a little bit of uh, numerical error. So that's verifying that we can indeed determine the effective porosity from this kind of data. We can also determine the retardation factor. Um, if we determine the arrival time of this pulse, again using the first moment, then we can get the velocity of this compound. And doing that here, the, the first moment was uh, 20,700 seconds. And that's, I guess, right in here. So notice it's not the peak. Uh, it's a bit off the peak. But the first moment is what we want to use. And that gives us a velocity of uh, this number here. 
and the retardation factor by definition is the ratio of the velocity of the water to the velocity of the contaminants and that gives us a value of 2.3. Um, so this is this is indeed how these different quantities the retardation factor and the effective porosity are determined in the field. We're using uh, essentially what we're doing here is using this simulation to um, as a surrogate field uh, experiment to illustrate how these calculations are done.